Welcome back, everyone. We're here with our second host call of the weekend, episode 1969. If you want to follow along with all the questions today, do feel free. You can head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 1969 for those questions today. All right, all things wellness, weight loss, anti-aging, mindset, you name it, we're going to tackle it today. Uh, really looking forward, like I said, to these questions the question uh, today, first question is from Sarah. It came in on May 4th. So it does look like we're between seven and eight weeks behind. So if you asked your question before May 4th, it has already been answered on a previous house call. Um, and again, there's really no way to know when your uh, question will be answered. I do hope that you're tuning in uh, on a weekly basis to stay tuned. But we do answer a half dozen questions on Saturday and a half dozen on Sunday, so a dozen questions total, all right? If you don't want to wait the seven to eight weeks, totally get it, I understand. Please ask the question over at cabralsupportgroup.com and uh, you'll get your answer right over there. All right, Sarah is up first. Let's get into it. Sarah says, hi, Dr. Cabral. Thank you so much for all the time you put into uh, to help everyone. I really appreciate it. I've learned so much from you. Thank you, Sarah. appreciate that. My question is, I have histamine intolerance, and I'm certain that I have a leaky gut as I have a lot of food sensitivities. I only get this during hay fever, hay fever season. This is my second year of controlling through diet and not pharmaceuticals. I'm keeping a very detailed food diary with symptoms, and I'm also tracking my weight daily. I would like to know what your thoughts are on looking at weight when trying to work out food sensitivities. Also, during menstruation, is it natural to gain any weight at all? Just so I can factor this in when I'm tracking. I do not have any history of eating disorders, and I wish I could afford labs maybe one day. Thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, so yeah, there is, again, if there's no disordered eating, if there's no issues with weighing yourself, then if, as long as you have the understanding that your weight's going to change on a daily basis, up and down within like 1%, then it's not a big deal. Because again, women's body is about 60% water, men's body about 65% water. It, I mean, both are about the same. Honestly, it's about two thirds your weight. So if you look at just like 1% difference in water weight, then you're looking at, if you weigh 150 pounds, it's 1.5 pounds different. It's a big difference. That's why when you start your day first thing in the morning, you're always going to typically be your lightest because you haven't drank anything for the last eight or 10 hours. So you're fairly dehydrated. Hydrated. So if you hop in the scale and then you do it again before going to bed, you're, you're typically going to be one or two percent higher. So if you weigh 150 pounds, you're going to be one and a half to three pounds weight more at night. That doesn't mean you put on three pounds of fat. It just means you hydrated your system. That's not a bad thing. Again, a lot of people don't teach that, but they really should be because that doesn't mean that you're gaining a ton of weight. Now, let's say though that you gain 3% over the course of a day of your body weight, 4%. Now we're looking at, okay, there's something going on with digestion, inflammation, or potentially, like you said, your menstrual cycle. So many women will gain between three and five pounds the week or so of um, before the menstruation begins. So uh, day one is the first day of menstruation. So before day one, let's say we'll move back. So it's days 22 to like day 28 of your cycle. Some women do gain a little bit of water weight. Now that comes typically from more estrogen dominance. I know you said you couldn't run a lab, but if one day you're able to, you might want to run that stress hormone hormones, mood and metabolism, and look for estrogen dominance. If not, you might want to use a product like Estrogen Balance over at Equalife. Okay, how else can I help you with this? Let's see. Uh, you certain you have leaky gut. Okay, well, if you can't run a lab for, for intestinal permeability-based issues, then I would go right into the CBO protocol. So I would do the CBO protocol followed by the CBO finisher, which is how you heal and seal that gut. So that's what I would do. Um, Sarah, hopefully that's helpful. Kevin's up next. Hi, Dr. Paul. I was wondering if you have had a chance to view the documentary Sea Spiracy. If so, what are your thoughts on the ability to actually accomplish sustainable fishing, along with the true quality of the fish we are consuming? As stated in the documentary, wild and organic fish are not truly reflective of those labels. Thank you. So, Kevin, it's a really, I mean, I have not watched the documentary, but, you know, I've heard quite a bit about it. Um, I will i will end up, end up uh, watching it. It's just not, like, right there at the top of my list right now. I've been super busy. Uh, with the transition moving back to the Northeast, um, well, in a, in a couple days from now. So uh, how can I answer this for you, though? I do agree. I, I think that there is a lot of mislabeling between wild and organic. You don't want organic fish, by the way. Organic fish is like organic meat. It just organic eggs. It means that it was fed organic soy, organic canola, organic, what else do they feed a lot of um, 
organic soy, organic corn is a big one. Those are a lot. So you wanna be careful of that because those aren't health foods either. So what you really want is wild. Now, this is what I look for because I buy pastured eggs and I buy wild fish. Now, if we're talking about wild salmon, like that's a common one, right? Okay, you know if it's wild salmon, no doubt about it, it is almost red. If it is a light orange or orangey color, it's typically not wild even if they say that it is, right? So you wanna actually look, like the proof is actually in the fish itself. So it's an important one to look at it. I know where you're coming from. There's also microplastics, there's a lot of issues. Here's what I think. I think that we're gonna to have to move to uh, wild farmed fish. Now, let me explain that. I've never talked about it before in a podcast. I believe we are going to need to net off certain parts of the ocean. And we're, now we're not talking about a football field. We're talking about 30 football fields. And that is going to be a salmon, let's say a wild salmon spawning ground. And we are going to let the fish live as they naturally would, but we're gonna keep it in more of a cleaner based environment. Right? There's going to be nets that don't allow plastics and other stuff in. There might be filtering. There's going to, there's going to have to be something. Because one is we're overfishing the sea. Uh, the second is that we're getting a lot of bad fish. And the third, I mean, the third is that there's all sorts of plastic in the, in the sea as well. So that's what I think. Uh, I still do eat fish. I just want to state that. And, um, but I'm very careful about the fish that I do consume. When in doubt, though, Kevin, when in doubt, sardines small mackerel, anchovy, the small fish are gonna be always your safest bet. All right, Eric is up next. Hello, love your podcast, learning a lot. I wanted to ask, I follow an Ayurvedic lifestyle and I wanted to ask a question. I eat two meals a day. My workday starts at 6 a.m. My first meal is usually around 5 a.m. Lunch between 11 and 12. I do not eat dinner, never been a night eater, but around 3 p.m. I have a smoothie. I want to try fasting from lunch to breakfast, giving me a 17 hour fast. I'm predominantly pitta. Can this throw me off, Erica? Okay, so I just wanna state this. You're doing three meals a day. You're not doing two meals a day. One's a smoothie, but it's still a meal. Like I do the same thing. So I do a smoothie and, and technically oatmeal two in the morning. But then I do a whole food lunch. That's my biggest meal. And then I do dinner, it's slightly smaller than lunch. So there's three meals. Um, I don't just do lunch and dinner, I also do breakfast, it just happens to be a smoothie. So, but that's not bad, like it sounds like you're doing great. Honestly, it sounds like you're doing great because you're picking your easiest to digest meal and putting it later in the day and there's nothing wrong with that. I like it first thing in the morning, you can do it. Again, we're drawing straws, you're doing fantastic. So you want to go from 12 to six. So I get it, you wanna go, or maybe more, you wanna go 16, 17 hours. Um, well, here's the thing, I want you to listen to this podcast because uh, is exactly what you're talking about. It's episode 1958. So episode 1958 just came out a couple weeks back. You would have already asked your question and it actually talks about skipping dinner. If you're gonna skip one meal, you shouldn't skip breakfast. It's actually not breakfast. Um, however, I do think that there's nothing wrong with getting in three meals between 5 a.m. and 12 or one o'clock in order to still be able to get that 16. Um, you could just make it you know, like a smoothie in between or maybe you combine your smoothie with something else. So I'll let you decide that. I would definitely listen to that podcast. Um, is it detrimental? It could it throw you off? Well, it could. Uh, I would run your stress hormones, mood and metabolism fast to look at your cortisol first, to look at your cortisol and thyroid levels. Um, and if you're someone that typically loses more weight than gains weight, it might be detrimental. If you're someone that typically trends more towards gaining more weight than losing weight, it could be beneficial, all right? Time will tell. Nicolette's up next. Hi, Dr. Ball. First, thank you for your guidance and expertise over the years. I've been working so hard to remove as many toxins as possible and get myself to the healthiest spot. I love your resources page to help with this transition. I recently purchased a Berkey. I received feedback saying that's not the best option since they are not third party certified. Also with Equal Life, I've transitioned all of my supplements over to them, but I'm worried why they don't share their certificate of analysis, COA. I think transparency would really help ease people's minds. Can you provide guidance around these two things? As always, thank you. All right, happy to answer this. Um, I don't know about Berkey. I'm pretty sure they do show third-party testing, so I would just ask about that. With Equal Life, we do third-party testing on all of our products. So 
all of our custom manufactured products are third party tested. But not only that, they're tested twice. And they are at FDA based facilities. So I just want to break down the process just a little bit. We test the material coming in first for heavy metals. And it's also tested for other contaminants like yeast, bacteria, mold. Okay, so it comes into the lab, uh, comes into the manufacturer. And let's say it's like daily nutritional support. They're testing the different protein, they're testing the different products for all the heavy metals and contaminants, okay? Then, uh, when it's actually formulated, we're testing for dosages, right? To make sure it's the proper dosage. And then only at that point, by the way, because this is an FDA lab, is it allowed to leave? You wouldn't even be able to get the product if it didn't pass inspection, just so you know that. Because it's not just us that would be liable, it's actually the manufacturer. It's the people that actually put all that product together. I formulate it, but they put it together, right? They're manufacturers. So they would be liable to the FDA and they would be shut down if they didn't follow this, just to let you know, right? And we've had to hold products, but like, like people will ship in, this happened to Thorne Research, a couple companies, and psyllium husk might have some mold in it. Guess what? Never gets used. It would never get used. I would never do that. Well, first of all, I can't do it just because of the FDA policies. And I would never do it because I use these products myself. Now, we look forward to one day being able to share that, but you have to keep in mind, we have over 100 different products. And all of those typically have three batches at one time going in. And then you have a before and after COA. So you're looking at 100 products times two. So you're looking at 200 times three at any one time. You're looking at, at a minimum, a minimum of 600 Certificate of analysis. Now, we have all of these on file, and they're all, all on the file with our, with our manufacturer. However, every lot number needs to match a certificate of analysis. I'm getting way too uh, in-depth here, but just know that everything is certified, and we're working on a digital system, which has never been done before in the industry. We are going to be groundbreaking with this. That actually matches up first with our most popular products, and then we'll roll them out to all products because of the massive amount of time that this is going to take. It's gonna take all new labels, um, a whole new system that no one's ever done before, but we're looking forward to breaking that ground. I can't tell you when, but what I can tell you is, um, Everything is, every, all of our custom manufactured products have a certificate of analysis. And um, that, is, uh, that is the best that I can say right now, because again, they wouldn't even be allowed to get to you if they weren't. All right, so hopefully that's helpful. And let's see, I think we have, how many questions have we done today? Sarah and Kevin and Erica and Nicolette. And okay, next up is Sophia. Dr. Brawl, is there a root cause for how people react to temperature. Cold weather people versus hot weather people is an idea that's thrown around sometimes. And I'm wondering if there's a way to control my preferences. I have seasonal depres depression in the summer and it usually starts because the heat makes me lethargic, uncomfortable and feel claustrophobic. It's like those three months of my life, I want to know if there's something I can do to control my anguish in the hot weather. I've tried yoga and take cold showers, exercise, drink lots of water. I'm on an SSRI, but if there's another way of controlling this annual downfall, I'd love to hear what you have to say. It's almost as debilitating as allergies. Thank you for any thoughts. Sophia, happy to help you with this, and I'm really sorry to hear that. So yes, in, um, in Ayurvedic medicine, the pitta is the hot person, the person that always runs hot. They like to be in the cold, one of my good friends, I remember going over his house in high school, he would have his AC, he had a small bedroom, his AC would be cranked to like, it'd be on like 59 degrees, and it was like an Arctic chill in there, and he's like the prototypical Pitta. Um, so what can you do? Well, you can actually take Pitta balancing herbs, that's the first step, and you'll find those through great Ayurvedic companies, Pitta balancing herbs. Um, you can also, uh, you know, Again, staying in a cool place obviously is great. Not exposing yourself to, ha to sauna, to hard, heavy workouts where you're going to overheat during just that 12 weeks. Uh, a lot of cold-based drinks, cooling-based foods. Look up uh, pitta-based foods. That will help with, and so pitta-pacifying foods, they're called. Pitta-pacifying. That will help uh, with cooling of the body as well. And what else can I tell you? What else can I share with you? And then again, I would look at overall homeostatic systems of the body. It sounds like your nervous system isn't quite in balance as to where it should be. So the, if I could only run one test, I would run the stress hormones, mood and metabolism. Uh, but in an ideal world, I would run the big five. All right, thanks, Sophia, great question. 
Another question here from Alyssa. Alyssa says, hi, Dr. Brawl, fellow Bostonian here. I'm curious if you've heard of David Sinclair's research out of Harvard University on anti-aging and using metformin and various supplements to reverse aging. What are your thoughts on his research and his personal anti-aging protocols he uses? What do you personally use? Thanks in advance. All right, so happy to answer this as well. Um, I've spoken about David Sinclair before. I would love to have him on the podcast. And I've also spoken about metformin before. So let's go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. All right, shall we? Uh, I'm going to go right over there right now. We got that brand new nav bar at the top. Uh, we put in the shop bar to make it easier for a lot of people. A lot of people ask for that. And the resources button is right at the top too, which makes it easy. So people are always writing in, where can I find the shop? Where can I find the resources? They're right there. All right, metformin I discussed on... Let's see, anti-aging biohacks on episode 1458. I discussed it on 1920, 1861, 785, 771, 603. So you can check those out. Um, and then it looks like there was one in 1583. I would, I would most likely, again, I can't remember exactly. I would probably look at 1458. I bet I talk about, uh, I bet I talk a lot about it there because it's called anti-aging biohacks. So check out 1458. With the be so I love I think David Sinclair's uh, work is fantastic groundbreaking fantastic huge fan um, he's very unbiased he talks about why you probably want to err more towards a plant based uh, diet err more towards Mediterranean diet again we're two people that believe in the research the difference is he's an actual researcher that's in the lab doing a lot of this research, right? I'm a clinical practitioner. I read the research. I believe the research. I take some of it with a grain of salt. And I look to people like David, of course, for a lot of uh, what's out there. However, however, I want to be careful after having said that because... A lot of the metformin studies are done with people with diabetes. Now, the interesting thing here is we don't know if you get the same effects if you don't have diabetes. And it seems that if you're taking metformin and exercising, you actually get detrimental effects, which means you don't actually get the metabolic muscular base stimulus while on metformin. So that was pretty discouraging when you look at the research on that. So I'm just not an advocate yet of using any pharmaceutical drug whatsoever. However, might you use a little bit of berberine instead of metformin? Might not be a bad idea. Again, at what age? That's what really matters. Uh, that's kind of how you have to look at it too. Uh, he talks a lot about NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide. I'll be talking about that more in the future. Uh, typically, the studies have been done on uh, just rats only or animal studies. The only human studies have been done on nicotinamide riboside. However, they just did a human study on nicotinamide mononucleotide, and it looked good. So uh, there's that. And then he's also a fan of resveratrol. Um, I don't know if he's talked about quercetin yet. I'm a fan of, of quercetin for anti-aging. So yes, I do believe in uh, all of this. I don't believe in the mega doses. That's for sure. I'm not a mega dose supplement person. Uh, I believe in a good daily foundation protocol, like the daily foundation protocol level two or level three that I use. I believe in using the immunity protocol. And then uh, yes, I do use some anti-aging based products. I'm going to talk about that more in the future because I really want to outline everything for you perfectly. Um, but I, again, I am a fan. I use Hispro as well. So I'll just tell you that I do use Hispro, which is um, quercetin at a good dosage, 400 milligrams, and um, stinging nettles in that, bromelins in that, uh, vitamin C is in that. So I'm a fan of those. Uh, I am a fan of NMN uh, or nicotinamide riboside. I'm a fan of some resveratrol. So I will be talking about more of those in the future. And um, if you know David, let him know. We'd love to have him on the podcast. Get him in front of our community as well. All right. Great questions today. Appreciate you. Amazing, amazing questions. Really do love our community. So thank you so much as always for your support. If you haven't left a podcast review, I would love for you to do that. It takes you less than a minute and it's a huge support to the podcast as well. So uh, thank you again. Like I said, appreciate you. And we'll be back tomorrow on our Motivation and Mindset Monday. Take care.